go again. Welcome back, Mummy's Boys and Daddy's Girls. My name's Danny, my own worst enemy podcast. Right, a couple of updates before we get started on today's episode. Um, well, first things first, I managed to get my house put back together. I think, like I said in the past episode, I've been living in a shithole for the past month, while we've been completely redecorating the upstairs of the house. Um, been doing it on the cheap, <laughs> doing a lot, of, a lot of the work ourselves, which is why it's taken so long. Uh, but it's all done now. All the decorating's done. All the bedrooms are done. The hallway, the landing, the stairs, kitchen. It's all done. And the furniture's all out of the living room again now, so I can actually sit down at my desk and get some work done again. Cause yeah, cause everything's been so up in the air. I've fallen pretty far behind with my like my publishing schedule. Cause I've actually got like got like six episodes in the bag that just need sort of editing and shoving out there. So um, yeah, I'm gonna try my best to up the ante a little bit and maybe push out a couple of episodes each week now until I catch up with myself. Um, so yeah, just to give you a little heads up, we've got episodes on uh, postnatal depression. PTSD, uh, stress, and now it's linked to depression and anxiety. Uh, we've got an episode on why mental health campaigners are doing more harm than good. And we've also got an episode on why it may be time to scrap psychiatric diagnoses. Both are uh, controversial topics, those latter two in particular. So it'll be interesting to see the reaction I get to those when I put them out. Oh, also... I went for my Method of Levels therapy session with Warren Mansell the other day and got that recorded. So uh, hopefully that'll give you a little more insight into how Method of Levels therapy looks in practice when we get that published. Uh, so yeah, plenty to look forward to, plenty to keep me busy. Um, what else? Oh yeah, right. Reached a couple of important milestones this past week. Uh, first one was we finally reached... 100 likes on the Facebook page, which I know isn't massive, but it's better than a kick up the ass. And it's precisely because the numbers aren't so big that it's all the more reason, I think, to say thank you to those of you who have taken the time to give the page a thumbs up. Because, you know, the more you guys recommend the podcast, the more people we reach who don't already know about it. So, yeah, thank you to you guys on Facebook. Uh, secondly, and even more sort of meaningful to me anyway, was I got my first paid subscriber. Um, yeah. So I've had a, I've had a donation page up on the website for, um, a while now and I've not been pushing it or advertising it because I've not been entirely sure which way to go about sort of funding this little project, whether to go down the advertising route or to ask for donations. Uh, because I've gotten to a point now where I think I would like to spend more time on this and sort of publish more often uh, and possibly expand it into doing, you know, videos for YouTube and maybe doing like Facebook live interviews and stuff like that. But, but yeah, like I say, I hadn't sort of made my mind up which way to go with it. Uh, and I know it's only one subscriber, but it's amazing. It feels amazing. The idea that someone is enjoying the podcast enough to yeah, donate their hard-earned money to support it. It's given me a bit of a bit of faith that maybe maybe I am doing something of value with you, you know, and yeah, maybe I can take this to the next level without having to sort of fill the podcast with adverts and stuff, which, yeah, it's encouraging. Um, so, Miranda, I won't give your surname out, but you know who you are, and I've already sent you an email, but I just want to say thank you very much again. I really appreciate the support. You're, you're a pioneer, and... You're amazing. Um, and now that, yeah, that first subscription sort of put the wheels in motion, I feel a bit more comfortable sort of putting it out there that, you know, if if you enjoy this podcast, if you feel it's of any value and you want to help support it, that would be massively appreciated. Uh, you can do a, a monthly or one-off donation, anything from a quid or a dollar or just, you know, whatever you feel it's worth. And if you do, I'll make sure to thank you personally for it. You won't just get no bog standard copy and paste email nonsense from me um careful you don't live too close to manchester i might just show up at your house <laughs> creep through your window at night and come and spoon you in your bed uh, <laughs> no but seriously i think um yeah once we've kind of built up a decent number of monthly subscribers and 
yeah, not a massive number, maybe like, you know, 30 to 50, something like that. I will start going to work then on producing exclusive content purely for paid subscribers. I'm thinking maybe like uh, Q&A episodes with like different experts on, you know, more kind of like practical topics and you guys can submit the questions and stuff. Um, maybe giving access to interviews being recorded live on Facebook and YouTube and, you know, again, where you guys can sort of submit questions in real time and get involved. Uh, we could do uh, like round table discussions on Periscope, um, maybe have a, an exclusive Facebook group where we can all talk to each other and you guys can maybe help me decide on subjects and, you know, guests for the podcasts and that sort of thing. So yeah, if you do choose to donate, I, I promise to do my best to make it a worthwhile investment. So yeah, anyway, if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, just go to myownworstenemy.org forward slash support um, and then just leave your bedroom window open, like I said. <laughs> uh, right, moving on. Today's episode, a beginner's guide to psychoanalysis. My guest today is Elizabeth Lumbeck. Liz is Professor of the History of Science at Harvard University, specialising in the history of psychoanalysis, psychiatry and psychology, with allied interests in women and gender, intellectual and cultural history, and the 20th century United States. She's the author of a number of books, including the multi-award winning The Psychiatric Persuasion, Knowledge, Gender and Power in Modern America, and The Americanization of Narcissism, for which she received the 2015 Courage to Dream Book Prize from the American Psychoanalytic Association. Liz is also an academic program graduate of the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and holds a master's degree in counselling psychology from William James College. So, the reason I wanted to do this episode is because of all the reading I've done about psychology and mental health over the past few years, I sort of completely avoided pretty much anything to do with psychoanalysis. And there's a couple of reasons for that. On the one hand, uh, well, it's everyone takes the piss out of it for a start. It's like, like it's outdated, it's useless, it's all about sort of, you know, repressed memories and shagging your mum. But on the other hand, when you do sort of attempt to look past the caricature and try and take it seriously, it's like you're immediately bamboozled by the sheer complexity of it all. And I don't know, it just seems like the least accessible and like the least welcoming of all the psychological schools of thought. So like, you know, the natural reaction to that predicament is to just say, oh, well, bollocks to it then, I'm not interested. But yeah, I am interested. There's something very intriguing about the idea of sort of delving into the human psyche to a depth that, you know, things like CBT and a lot of modern psychology doesn't seem to bother with. And yeah, even if it's a lot of it's purely speculative, it's just, I don't know, it's super intriguing to me. So I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to step inside this infinite labyrinth of psychoanalysis with this podcast, we may as well start from scratch. So, yeah, if you imagine, like, the whole body of psychoanalytic theory is like a building the size of the bleeding Burj Khalifa in Dubai, this episode is us just sort of <laughs> peering through the letterbox on the ground floor, <laughs> maybe inspecting the doorframe a little bit. But that's it. Um, now, I'd say for the, the first third of the interview, I sort of struggled to find my feet a bit because... Well, I haven't got a clue where we're going with it, to be honest. I'm sort of all over the place, and I don't think Liz has got a clue where I'm trying to lead her either. So I think the the, the first part of this interview is a bit like, if you imagine like a, a, a piss-drunk blind man at the wheel of a speedboat, that's me. And then Liz is just sort of the like a water skier hanging off some rope at the back, clinging on for dear life. But yeah, about 20 minutes, half an hour into it, I do get into the swing of things eventually. And... Yeah, I think the, the final product is actually actually serves as a pretty good starting point, particularly from the perspective of what psychoanalysis looks like in practice today. So, yeah, I think it I think it proved a success. Anyway, as always, you can find the show notes by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. It's also where you can comment on the episode if you wish to do so. And you know what I'm gonna say? As always. 
Please enjoy my conversation with Professor Elizabeth Lumbeck. Right, okay. Elizabeth Lumbeck, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, finally got there in the end. Been a, a lot of back and forth. There's been so much back and forth between us that somewhere along the way in our emails, Elizabeth became Liz. Um, yes. So are you okay with Liz or would you prefer? I prefer that. You prefer Liz? Okay. I prefer Liz. Well, yes. we'll keep it at Liz then. Right. So yeah, today's topic is we're talking about psychoanalysis and I already know, I already, I, I usually fuss about trying to think of a, um, like a title for the podcasts, mm -hmm. like five minutes before I publish them. I already know I'm going to call this one a beginner's guide to psychoanalysis. Okay. And because we really are, I mean, you really are starting from scratch on this one with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, okay. I've done a little bit of research, but it's, it's, it's such a huge complex topic. Mm -hmm. Well, right listeners, here's how complex it is. I contacted Liz to invite her to to do this interview with me and my proposed questions <laughs> weren't right so that Liz had to come up with some questions for me to ask her that's how much I don't know what I'm talking about um <laughs> so yeah the, the the reason I'm doing this is uh, f for one I think it's an interesting subject but more than that I want to find out whether this common caricature of Freud and psychoanalysis is well, got, got any kind of basis to it, really. I think the co the common view of Freud and psychoanalysis is that Freud's this kind of, the, and this old bloke who was obsessed with sex, and he said that all of our problems as adults could kind of be uh, kind of put down to this unrequited, incestuous desire for our mothers during childhood. And that psychoanalysis <laughs> involves basically lying on a, a chaise lounge for an hour, talking about your childhood and maybe how much you hate your parents while the therapist kind of sits there behind you scribbling on a clipboard giving zero advice and then charging extortionate amounts of money for the privilege <laughs> so that's what we're unraveling today to find out right. <laughs> whether any of that's true and to actually put some meat on those caricatured bones i guess so before mm -hmm. before we jump in if you wouldn't mind i'm interested if you could tell us a little bit about yourself I know that you're a historian of human sciences primarily, but specialising in, in psychoanalysis. So I'm interested, firstly, why history? And then also why the history of psychoanalysis? Okay, so um, I have to say, first of all, that the caricature <laughs> lives on. Um, it's very much what informs the kind of standard issue New Yorker cartoon. I don't know if you've seen these where like at least once a month, there's a cartoon with the psychiatrist, psychoanalyst sitting back, sometimes falling asleep yeah. person lying on the couch. It's very much alive, but it is a caricature. So we'll get back to that. Um, but it's an interesting one. It does like all good caricatures. It captures some truth. So I've just been a historian forever. Like, so I guess the question for me is why I became a historian of psychoanalysis. Um, when I first went to university, I just studied history and fell in love with sort of not really the past, but trying to understand people, um, which is what historians do, at least trying to understand people's motivations, um, why they do the things they do, why people do such bizarre, self-destructive things, which, you know, looking at it now, I can say psychoanalysts have some of the same interests. My first book was on psychiatry. I was interested in how the discipline switched from focusing on sort of insane people, those sort of institutionalized for, you know, breaks with common human experience to focusing on all of us. So focus on everyday experience. And that led me in my later work into psychoanalysis. I, I did a book with a psychoanalyst on an early American case of hysteria. And then I turned to the issue of narcissism as a kind of cultural object, focus of concern, as well as an internal 
psychoanalytic issue. And I published a book on narcissism a couple of years ago. Um, it's a good time to be interested in narcissism because there's so much talk about it, especially with our president. Um, <laughs> and I've just written something on that. Uh, so I've come to psychoanalysis through the years. I also did a training course, a five-year course in psychoanalytic training at the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute and did clinical training um, and got a master's in psychology recently, last few years, um, and did my clinical work at a hospital, psychiatric institution near Boston called McLean Hospital in a residential treatment center for women diagnosed with borderline personality disorders. So I've got a fair amount of clinical experience, but um, I'm primarily an academic interested in the history of psychoanalysis. So did you um, did you get interested or decide to get actually trained in psychoanalysis? Was that just a way of, of fleshing out your understanding of the historical perspective or was it with some maybe desire to become a, a therapist in that field? It was a little bit of both. Um, I, I feel like much of um, what's written about psychiatry, psychoanalysis by historians is written from an outsider's perspective in which it's very easy to sort of finger wag and say, oh, no, no, you got it all wrong. You don't understand, you know, we, the historian, the outside critic, understand what you're trying to do. And I, I feel the real limitations of that. You know, if someone were going to write a history of chemistry or physics, you'd want them to know something about chemistry or physics. And I feel the same holds for psychoanalysis. Um, it's an incredibly complicated um, field with many different internal traditions. It seems in some ways to not have a specialized language. It, a lot of its terms are vernacular terms, so it seems kind of um, transparent, but I think that's very misleading. It's not transparent. It, it is There is a lot of theory development that's interesting that has not a whole lot to do with external forces. Um, there are problems internal to the discipline. So I felt like it was important for me to understand psychoanalysis from the inside if I was really going to understand it and teach about it and write about it. So that was part of it. And the other is I just had a longstanding interest in clinical work. Um, so I, and I teach, for example, I teach a course on the history of psychotherapy. Um, and I teach a lot about psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And I felt like it would be useful to get that experience um, to enhance my teaching, writing as well. Yeah, I think it's a, a move possibly a lot of other academics could um, follow suit with, I think. Um, okay, so, right, speaking of the like the inner complexities of it. So when when people think psychoanalysis, I think they automatically think Freud. Mm -hmm. um, but again, my reading of it, it seems that it kind of, after Freud and, and then a uh, guy called uh, Adler and then Jung, and Jung, Carl Jung's fascinating. I need to get around to Carl Jung at some point. Um, it kind of exploded out into all these separate little disciplines. And then there was Neo-Freudians, Eric Fromm and Jacques Lacan, who did a kind of a, a very European centric version of psychoanalysis. And so when you ask this question of what is psychoanalysis, it's tricky to kind of know even to kind of where to begin. And also I, f I found this, I found this quote by a guy called uh, Drew Weston at uh, mm -hmm. Emory University. Mm -hmm. And so he says, uh, so many many aspects of Freudian theory are indeed out of date, and they should be. Freud died in 1939, and he's been slow to undertake further revisions. His critics, however, are equally behind the times, attacking Freudian views of the 1920s as if they continue to have some currency in their original form. Uh, psychodynamic theory and therapy have evolved considerably since 1939. Contemporary psychoanalysts and psychodynamic therapists no longer write much about ids and egos, nor do they conceive of treatment for psychological disorders as an archaeological expedition in search of lost memories. So it sounds to me that, so if someone today was seeking psychoanaly psychoanalytic treatment, that they probably wouldn't be walking into an office where Freud was the kind of the theoretical paradigm. 
So I was wondering if it's kind of wise of us to split this into two halves, this discussion, and to first talk about the Freudian foundations of psychoanalysis and then maybe move on to discuss what's changed and then maybe how it plays out in its current form. Sure. Is that Does that sound okay to you? Yeah, it's a complicated question. It's a complicated question because I, I agree with Drew Weston. However, Freud still looms very large in the discipline. Right. Um, so psychoanalysts have a very kind of bifurcated notion of, of time. On the one hand, you know, it's, there's a hundred years of psychoanalysis and there's been all these developments year by year, this happened and then that happened and so on. And on the other hand, all the people who are speaking to an issue can it sometimes feels like they're all in the same room at the same time. Like Freud's still here saying something and someone from the fifties and Neo Freudian is in the room and we've got a new relational person. So there's can be a conversation that in which the element of the passage of time is completely um, missing. Um, so Freud is still Kind of foundational figure, but many people are not Freudians. Um, that is, they don't adhere chapter and verse to what Freud said. There are people who still still do, which is why you're wanting to separate it into two um, halves of the conversation. It, I mean, it makes sense because it's such a complicated field, but it doesn't entirely capture the reality that there are Freudians still practicing. Um, and who still believe that if Freud said it, it must be right. I'm not a Freudian. I think Freud is brilliant. I think he's a great writer, but I'm not a Freudian. Um, revisionism of Freud started coincident with Freud. Um, the way we often tell the history of the field is there's Freud, and then people came along and started to revise him later. The way I look at it is that basically there's two traditions in psychoanalysis from around 1910. There's the Freudian tradition and then there's a revisionist tradition that I um, see taking shape in the person of his um, Hungarian uh, colleague, Sandor Ferenczi, um, who challenged Freud at many points. They were incredibly close, but also... Um, they split. Now, what did they split over? Um, this goes into what Freud stands for. So the, the story we tell about Freud is, um, I mean, one story we tell is that he used to, in the 1880s and 1890s, believe his women patients when they said that they had been um, sexually aggressive on by their fathers or by men. Then... 1897, he saw the light and he realized that too many of the women patients were telling this story and it was actually a fantasy they had of desire for the father. Um, and it's seen as that moment when he saw that is seen as foundational for psychoanalysis because it inaugurates the idea of a reality that is psychic reality. It's neither true nor false, but it's psychic reality um and that so that leads to the whole what you referred to about the oedipus complex um sort of the the boy's desire for his um mother and the father stepping in and cutting that off and so on so that's the part of freud that people now are like scratch their heads and like that's ridiculous um Ferenczi in um near the end of his life in the late 20s and early 30s, he died in 1933, um, he, he was a theorist of trauma. Freud was a trauma theorist, um, but Ferenczi was much more of a modern trauma theorist. And Ferenczi believed that the effects of trauma could be seen in the here and now, in the analytic relationship. Um, and he was very focused on what he called um, the reality of trauma and real rape believed in the fact that people, that women had actually been, women and children, people, those children had been um, sexually assaulted and that it had dire effects on their psychologies later on. 
and Freud and he split over this issue. Um, Ferenczi is also much more of a relational psychoanalyst. That is, he was interested in the relationship between the analyst and patient. Freud was not so much interested in that. He was what we would call a one person psychoanalyst. Like the analyst had some of the truth of the matter about the patient. And the idea was to interpret that and give the patient the interpretations. Ferenczi was of the belief that that in itself could be traumatizing. Um, so these are positions that are still defining the field today, I would say. Um, there have been many backs and forths and crossings and people um, kicked out of psychoanalysis for not being insufficiently orthodox. But I would say that the main split, the fault line um, in psychoanalysis um, exists from the 1910s on. So it's a different kind of history than most people would tell. Right. Okay. See, that, that, I mean, that's already, we're already getting com very complex there and, and kind of down yeah. into the nitty gritty. So bring me, bring me back to something simpler then. Yeah. So what, what I think I'd like to do really is so that it's like I say, this is going to be kind of a, a beginner's guide to psychoanalysis. Right. And I think I'd like to kind of ground it in conditions like depression and anxiety they're they're the kind of most common depression common conditions that my listeners suffer from so i think what i'd like to do is if we start from kind of some of the the talking about if we can assume no prior knowledge on the part of the listener and talk about some of the fundamental tenets of psychoanalysis be that freud or anybody else and then once we've kind of established them, then we'll kind of bring it into bring it into the therapy room, if you like, and say, right, well, how do these apply to things like depression and anxiety? If that mm -hmm. makes, if that's, <laughs> you don't look convinced. <laughs> what are you thinking? Um, it's interesting you say that because I I think of personality disorders as also something that people seek psychoanalytic help for okay, um, or psychoanalytic understanding, but right. So what would be the basics? I think to go back to what Drew Weston said, um, you know, he's the one who said people are attacking a kind of straw man. They're going back and attacking Freud of the 1920s. The, Focus in modern psychoanalysis, and I'm going to be generalizing here, is not so much on, as he said, the archaeological digging down deep layers in the psyche to find an original trauma, as it is on what is going on between the therapist and the patient in the moment. So one of the most important, um, I'll, I'll call it a discovery of Freud's, is transference. The idea that if I am talking to you, you do not appear to me as a blank slate or as just who you think you are. I bring a whole world of experience to my understanding of you. So you might remind me of my brother, of my father, of someone I knew, and I might start acting toward you in that way that's puzzling to you. Like, you would say, I'm, but I'm not your father, but, and I would, but, you know, you're acting like that. Um, Freud believed that transference was a, was a key um, kind of tool for the therapist. And analysts today are very focused on transference. An analytic attitude would say that there's transference in every relationship. We never really see people as they actually are, as if we could get to that. But we bring our own preconceptions of who people are um, to someone. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of you meet someone and you feel like you've known them before. Oh, of course, like, yeah. Like they just seem so familiar. It's a it's kind of variant of that. I mean, I, I feel like I go through life and the same characters in some ways come, come up over and over. Like I, that was someone I knew in elementary school. So that's, that's transference. And transference um, is a tool 
that allows the therapist to figure out what's going on with the um, client or the patients, what's going on with them in the moment. So the focus is not on, you know, digging up what happened in the past, although certainly there would be talk of that as it is trying to understand how the patient makes use of the therapist. So how am I making use of you? How am I kind of characterizing you? And what does that say about my psychology? So that would be one of the tools. Um, and that would be one of the foci. And then the other sort of higher level uh, concept would be counter transference, how the therapist experiences the patient. So the analyst might experience the patient as incredibly needy or demanding. And that is information that the analyst can use to try and understand what's going on, what it, it feels like to be that patient. So the person I mentioned before, Ferency, came up with this idea of empathy, which is now everywhere. But empathy is really important in the analytic um, space. It comes from German, a German um, word meaning feeling into. So empathy is putting, trying to get inside the head of someone else to feel what they are feeling. And that is what a good empathic analyst will do, is trying to use the relationship to understand what the person who's come for help is feeling, how they're experiencing the world, what they're afraid of, um, what's holding them back, what's inhibiting them, what's getting in the way of relationships and so on. I've got to say, the problem I see there, though, is that surely the therapist is, they're not immune to bringing their own prejudices and and, and ideas yes. to the table. So how can they derive truth from or infer anything from, from, from that interaction when you've got two people that are both bringing prejudices and preconceived ideas to the table that's precisely the problem okay and that's what makes like, that that is i mean that you've you've got it on you perfectly captured both the dilemma and the strength of the treatment so if you were to ask me just to step out for a second what were the big discoveries of freud i would say one would be transference and one would be um that we are not always in charge of ourselves, that we have unconscious feelings. Some people would say we have an unconscious, a part of ourselves that we, we're not aware of. And if you believe in that, you have to believe in what you just said, which is that the analyst can't always know what she's thinking. Because if she did, if she was completely aware of herself, that wouldn't be a very analytic idea because you she wouldn't be there. You cannot be aware of your unconscious feelings. So the way that analysts deal with this is there's a lot of back and forth, um, a lot of spoken sort of, some people would call them interpretations. Other people would just say talk back and forth. I feel like, are you saying this? Are you feeling this? Um, to try and really get out what is going on. Um, is there a truth? There's, I would say there's probably many truths, but there's not like one singular truth about a person would be an analytic idea. But the dilemma you've portrayed of two people not really knowing what's going on about themselves or each other um, is precisely the analytic setting I will say, however, though, that analysts have many years, by the time they're analysts, of experience in dealing with this and have the tools to help them understand their own reactions to patients. And it's a very powerful way of thinking. Um, you know, watching good analysts, very experienced analysts, make sense of what's going on between two people is really a very exciting to me um, experience because they do have, um, they have so much experience in understanding what's going on. Um, they do have a way of just kind of 
proposing a hypothesis um, about, you know, that sounds to me like when your mother says to you, blah, blah, blah. And the patient might say, wow, you know, that's right. That it is, that is what I'm saying. I do feel like you're, you know, I'm in the presence of my mother and you're saying the same thing or something like that. So it's both a, a limitation because there isn't a like single truth that can be gotten at, um, like by digging away at the layers, for example, to find out what's like really inside someone. But it, it's also a method. Um, it's an exploratory method of trying to get reach some understanding between two people. Um, does that make more sense? Yes, it does. It does. It's kind of um, this is a terrible word. I think I wish I could think of a, a a a better one, but it's kind of a a kind of a dialectical relationship between the two. Yeah, um, like a constantly evolving reanalysis. It's so, so it's almost like it rather like you were saying instead of like digging down into someone's psyche it almost sounds like digging up into I don't know I don't know I don't know what I mean by that but right so the old model the Freudian original Freudian model was the archaeological model that you dig down through layers like you would dig down through layers of an archaeological site to find an original trauma um, and once you found the trauma and then you said to the patient that's the trauma the patient would be oh fine and then they you know they'd be better right? because they would, they would see the light of day. That was the original model of hysteria, that there'd been some sexual trauma. You would dig down because the patient had hidden it because it was too dangerous to know. Um, but once it had been uncovered, then the patient would get better. Well, that's way too simple. Um, and the way we talk now is there's a lot of on the surface. So, it, the whole idea of depth, I mean, people talk about depth psychology, um, like we have a sense that there are inner depths in ourselves, right? Like you were talking about digging down. But a lot of what I'm talking about, you're right, is happening on the surface. It's in the here and now. It's not in the past. It's like, what is going on right now? Now, people bring to the here and now scenes from their past. They bring narratives all of us have our own narratives about our experience and about the way the world works narratives from the past or we recreate in the context of the relationship a scene from our past with say a very powerful father and a frightened son um if that is a kind of foundational scene for someone where you know father was dominating domineering, sort of cruel, but sort of supportive in some ways, the, the analytic idea is that the patient will bring that scene to the treatment, not by saying father was dominant, domineering, blah, 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 but by reenacting it, like by setting up the conditions for reenacting it. And Ferenczi in the 1920s was aware that patients will reenact experiences from their lives that they can't put into words. They will bring them into the analytic setting and let the analyst know what happened to them in the ways that they set up the situation. So it is very much about the surface, as you say, in some ways. It's what, what, what do we have before us that's going on? So some of these older ideas of Freud's, so let's take that, the, this idea of, um, the, the ego, the id and the super ego. Right. So these aren't in play so much anymore. They are for some people. I tend for one, I don't like to think of them because they're so mechanistic to my mind. Um, well, could the we, idea could we that, just could we kind of give yeah. a brief summary of what those three are? Right. So, in the early 1920s, Freud came up with what was called the structural model, which was that the um, mind, the self, had three agencies. One is the ego, the I, who I am, 
You can think of it as the self. The other is the id, the it. That's the kind of dark roiling part that's all the nasty bits. And then the super ego, the over I, the conscience. So the aim was to enlarge the control of the ego over the id and to enlarge the control of the ego over the super ego so that you wouldn't be hemmed in so much by your conscience, that you could live more freely. So the super ego sort of clamps down on us, tells us what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. And Freud saw it as partly cultural, um, well, largely cultural, but also individual. The problem is that there's also a split between conscious thought and unconscious thought things that we're aware of and things that we're not aware of. And what Freud realized was that we're not always aware of what's in our ego. Like the ego has unconscious elements in it too. So it's very complicated, but he saw these as three agencies of mind. So the mind, you could draw out, like there's pictures he has of the mind. Um, And for many years, psychoanalysts um, subscribed, mainstream psychoanalysts, in the United States and to some degree in England, but not as much subscribed to what was called ego psychology, which was a variant of psychoanalysis, very Freudian, which held that the goal was, um, like I said, to enlarge the sphere of the ego, which was seen as to make us more autonomous, more in charge of ourselves, more, um, kind of aware Um, and to minimize the effects of the id and of the superego, the over the agency that kind of hems us in. So in a, in a simplistic sense, would I be right in thinking that the the goal of that then is trying to make it so that a person doesn't succumb to the base of desires, which are maybe, maybe sexual desires, wanting to go take drugs and live a kind of Epicurean lifestyle that might be instinctive, of the id and so to kind of get control over that but also to not be so uh, not conform to other people's rules and values so much is that right especially or kind of moral not to become overly moral overly susceptible to moral commands so that for example around sex so that you know one could enjoy um sexual expression without like becoming like a, a nun or a priest or mm. uh, cause Freud really disliked religion. Um, so right. The idea was a kind of happy medium between the two, you know, the two demands on oneself. So um, would, it, would it be right in thinking that? So if, if that was, if that was a goal of Freud was for people to attain that control over the ego, the, that control over the self, that am I right in kind of inferring from that that he felt there was some sort of pathology at either extreme so that to be a person that just succumbs to your base of desires and in uh, that that is some sort of pathology and to be someone who completely submits to other people's standards and, and values that, that that's some sort of pathology that needs to be fixed as well is that right mm-hmm. right the idea was to live in that middle space And the ego psychologists in America talked a lot about adjustment and had an idea of the personality as this kind of smoothly functioning machine. It's very idealized. Um, And the idea was you would go to psychoanalysis to kind of get tuned up and to get everything working really well. So what would be, say, if you were one of these people that was very, very subject to the id, if you like, and you were going out and you were, you were, you were just, you were partying all the time and you were sleeping around and you were engaging in reckless behavior. What would the, did, did that have, did that have a name? Did that have a a diagnostic kind of category back then that needed to be fixed? Um, analysts were, are, are not big on diagnosis so much. They don't like diagnostic categories. I mean, some do, there are like 
people who specialize in analytic diagnosis, but um, right. You know, the problem was the, you know, Freud believed that the goal was to love and to work. Well, that person probably didn't have very stable love relations and probably isn't working if they're doing drugs all the time. Although it's important to note that Freud understood why people turned to drugs and alcohol and so on, because civilization was so difficult. Life is so difficult. We need our pleasures, he said. Well, that's, so, um, sorry, that's, that's interesting. When you, when you were saying then that you're, sorry, you're not b- big on um, kind of diagnostic categorization, is that, is that part of psychoanalysis to not be, like, would a psychoanalyst have a copy of the DSM-5 on their bookshelf in the office that they would consult? Um, psychoanalysts are pretty, well, uh, first thing to say is a number of them are, are, are also psychiatrists, um, and psychiatrists would probably have the DSM-5. Um, I mean, psychoanalysts believe in character pathology, so, you know, if someone feels quite like they have a hysterical personality or are, you know, very narcissistic um, or borderline, you know, those, but I don't think they would, they would certainly not consult the DSM-5 checklist to figure out whether or not they are. Right, that's, well, that's, um, that's really interesting because, of course, when, when you've got things like, um, well, CBT is the big one and there's, CBT is kind of administered to each kind of, um, well, whatever the person's presenting with, you know, the CBT for OCD, the CBT for depression, that's kind of, kind of specialized for, for, for that particular right. condition. So if, if a person, let, so let's say, let's say a person has, they feel like they're struggling with, with depression and they've, they've, they've tried CBT it's they don't feel like it's work for them and they don't want to go down the, the you know they don't want to take medication or anything and they say you know what i know people make fun of it <laughs> but i'm going to have a crack at this 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 psychoanalysis mm-hmm. gig what would that person's experience be going into see a psychoanalyst oh well, first of all I, I should say the psychoanalyst might send the person for a psycho farm evaluation or if the psychoanalyst is also a prescriber suggests that the person go on an antidepressant because psychoanalysts are not opposed to drug therapies um and some for some people the drugs are fantastic um make it possible to actually get out of bed in the morning um A psychoanalyst would, so a person, uh, say someone's severely depressed, um, not just, you know, life is hard, but I'm really having trouble, like I said, getting out of bed in the morning, nothing gives me joy anymore. Um, I think uh, most analysts would probably start with some drug psychopharm. then you would try and get at under try to understand what this person's experience of, of daily life and life in general is like. So you would try and enter into the person's experience, trying to understand their relationships with other people. If they have them, are they powerful relationships or is the person profoundly alone um, trying to understand their relationships with their family. What was their experience growing up? What were some of the um, points at which they began to feel depressed? So it would be trying to understand everything you could about the patient. Um, it would not be immediately providing solutions. There would, wouldn't be homework um, as in CBT. Um there wouldn't be so much advice, although psychoanalysts certainly do give advice. There would be, um, you know, if the person was too depressed to take advantage of psychoanalysis and needed more intervention, 
probably the psychoanalyst would do more psychodynamic psychotherapy with them instead of having them say lie on a couch um, they would talk face to face. So it, it's hard to say what the experience would be because every, every analyst is different and every analytic pair is different, but it would be trying to really understand um, and get at, at some of the, sort of the roots of what what's going on like what's made this person depressed and how can we address that so it wouldn't be then that so let I me mean, let's take that that caricature into consideration there wouldn't be an assumption on the part of the psychoanalyst that if someone if someone's presenting with with depression there wouldn't be an assumption there that oh well there's something there's something happened back then in the childhood that's um, like a repressed memory or something, and that's what we need we need to get at. No, it's it's more subtle. It's you know, is is the does the person have a kind of depressive attitude towards life, or was the person doing okay and then overcome with depression that was either sparked by some life event? you know, some relational failure or um, can the person not finish writing their book or something like that? It would be more subtle. Do, is, there, is there any kind of concentration on the nature of the, the cognition that's, that's going on? So, you know, would you actually, right. w would you kind of dig into the, the, the rumination patterns or the, the actual, the content of the self-talk that the person's kind of walking around with? Yeah, I think, and so that would be a more kind of CBT um, sort of approach, right? To, to then say, well, look, you're, you're always, you know, you're always looking at the, the negative here or you can't see the positive or you're catastrophizing or, and so on. But certainly the analyst would um, attend to the content of what the person was saying and, and how they interpret, filter, make sense of things that are happening to them. And if it's always looking at the worst possible interpretation of something, which is something that CBT would, would look at as well. Certainly that would be part of the conversation. But it wouldn't be you have to change your way of thinking because telling people to change is one thing, but actually people actually changing is much more difficult. Like telling you to stop thinking negative thoughts, you can tell someone to stop thinking negative and help them stop thinking negative thoughts. But it's, it's really hard if you are caught in that to stop thinking negative thoughts. Yeah, I'm just, I'm think I'm just trying to kind of get a, a handle on how how psychoanalysis kind of conceptualizes these these different conditions, and maybe maybe I'm working from the wrong paradigm. If if it's it's not the done thing to kind of rely on those diagnostic criteria, but you know, like CBT, th there's a cognitive theory. Of, of depression and a cognitive theory of, of anxiety and I'm just wondering if if there's the same thing I mean it seems that like with with Freud the, those diagnostic categorizations didn't exist back then anyway but for modern psychoanalysis I'm I'm, I'm surprised that it seems that they don't take that di diagnostic criteria into account and there's no actual there's no conceptual model for what these what causes these ailments oh, I, I think there is not, I'm not the expert on this, so I don't want to be unfair to psychoanalysis. I, I haven't thought that much about depression and psychoanalysis. I mean, Freud certainly wrote about what he called melancholia, which was basically depression. But it was in terms of ex how, you ex how we experience our um, inner objects. That is our understandings of people inside of us. I guess my version, the version of psychoanalysis that I'm more interested in looks at ways in which people get engaged in repetitive patterns of behavior that they find difficult to break out of. So we all 
get stuck in repetitions. Like I, I talked before about sort of foundational scenes that are important in our lives and that we bring these to psychoanalysis and we get stuck in recreating these scenes over and over again in our lives. So if you think about, you know, say there's a bunch of young women who are good friends and one of the young women keeps dating guys who seduce her and then abandon her. And they're very exciting and kind of charismatic guys like her father, for example, um, who then drop her. You know, her friends might be able to say, see, when she meets a new one like this, oh, my God, she's going to do it again. She's going to get involved with this really exciting guy who's going to drop her. But she won't know that because it's so familiar. It's so exciting. It's it's what she's done forever. And it might be based on something to do with her childhood. It might not. Um, but a psychoanalyst would, would look at that, would begin to understand how she gets drawn into repeating the same pattern over and over and over. And we all do this. We all find ourselves repeating familiar patterns because we're creatures of habit. That's how we do. And we look for things in people that we either got or didn't get as children in our families. So psycho, a psychoanalyst would be looking at ways in which we were in relation to other members of our families in which we grew up. Um, if we had a depressive mother that we had to constantly prop up, for example, or if we had to take on the family depression or something. But I, I'm not the one to talk about a psychoanalytic theory of depression. I'm sure there are people who are. Okay. It's just not my specialty. So I don't want to undersell psychoanalysis on that. Yeah, I've got to say that this, the process of kind of just, you know, one person's talking, the, the patient's talking, the, the, the analyst is listening and maybe, you know, throwing out suggestions and uh, of, of things to, to rethink, you know, for maybe you want to consider it this way. Um, I've got to say, and I don't mean to sound condescending here or anything, but mm. I mean, what what's the difference between what a psychoanalyst does and what your friend down the pub might do for you? What I mean, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't mean to sound funny, but like, mm -hmm. like I say, with a a CBT therapist, there's a uh, there's a structure there. There's a way of of engaging with a patient, and you know, you could almost some of the engagements you have maybe with, with a CBT therapist, you could kind of map it on a flow chart. Right. But this just sounds very casual, like a casual chat with a friend. But it's not. So let me put it another way. So there's a British psychoanalyst named Winnicott that maybe you or your listeners have heard of, Donald Winnicott, who believed that the analyst – the analyst's role was to put himself in the position of being used by the patient. And, and the analyst was, had to survive anything the patient threw at him. So the patient could not defeat the analyst, could not kill the, the analyst psychologically. Um, the analyst doesn't have the same kind of needs in that relationship that a friend does. A friendship is mutual. There's a lot of mutuality in psychoanalysis, but it's a really a relationship for the benefit of the patient. It's not for the benefit of the analyst. And analysts, good analysts are very self-aware that they should, that they are, are careful, that they're not benefiting in some way emotionally by, you know, having, you know, good patients or having famous patients or financially by trying to keep patients in treatment, they, their sole role is to help the patient. So they put themselves, their self at the disposal of the patient to be used. So the patient can come up against them very hard 
but not destroy them. If you come up against a friend very hard, you'll destroy them, they'll leave. Um, probably everybody's had an experience of feeling incredibly used by someone or that a relationship is very one-sided. Psychoanalysis is mutual, but it is also one-sided in that way, in that it, the only thing that matters is for the benefit of the patient. Everything is for the benefit of the patient. So the analyst also, um, many, many people are raised by parents who say, you are thinking this, you feel this, I know what you're thinking, so that patients can get very, people can get very disconnected from their own thoughts. A good analyst won't do that, won't say, I know what you're th thinking. We'll try and figure out what are you thinking and allow patients to have their own mind. Um, many people have never been allowed to have their own mind. They've had parents, been raised by parents who need them to be a certain way. So patients need to experience having their own mind. Um, and I know it sounds kind of blousy and kind of new agey, but it's a very powerful experience for people who have never had that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that makes, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you are, that's very true. You, you are, when you're talking to a friend, you are at risk of, you're at risk of offending. You're at risk of, well, you could be putting your reputation at risk as, as opposed as well. I mean, this, you know, with a friend, you don't really know how much you can tell that person without them kind of, kind of going, um, gossiping. Um, yeah. okay. But again, what I would say is, um, a, I'd say a, a CBT therapist would offer the same in, in, in that regard. You know, if you take something like, um, OCD into consideration, especially people that have got these, you know, what they consider to be bad thoughts, you know, quite a common one is people have got a fear of being a paedophile. That's right. yeah, it's going to be a tricky one to share. So a CBT therapist is, you know, is going to offer that level of security to somebody. And you can, you can tell that person very explicitly that you're having these troubling thoughts and you can rest assured that it's not going to go any further. And, um, also a therapist will ask you to be completely honest in order to the, for the therapy to be most effective. It's best that you be as honest as possible and, 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 and don't keep anything. Anything you keep to yourself is something that's going to go unfixed. Right. So but I think I'm not talking just about confidentiality here. When I'm talking about having your own mind, um, I'm talking about an experience of being able to think. So patient, sometimes people who, whose parents need them to be a certain way end up with some variant of a personality disorder. They've never been allowed to be themselves. They have to be perfect, for example. Some very narcissistic parents raise children who have to always perform, always get perfect grades and marks always be the best at everything in order to prop up the parents' self-concept and sense of themselves as important. I don't know if you have these kind of parents here, but certainly in New York, <laughs> you know, there's parents who take their kids for interviews for nursery school when they're three years old saying, you've got to get little Johnny into Harvard. Um, <laughs> and if he doesn't get into your nursery school, he won't get into Harvard. If he doesn't get into Harvard, he won't be a success in life. A lot of those kids are just wrecks because they are extensions of their parents' narcissism. They've never had an experience of deciding what they want, what they think. Their parents are telling them that they think. Hey, you know, a kid says, I'm cold, I'm bored. The parent says, no, you're not. You're not cold, you're warm. You're not bored, you're lazy. You know, the, <laughs> yeah. the kid doesn't know their own experience. So it's a different, I mean, I think, um, CBT can be quite useful for a number of people and especially for OCD, it can be incredibly useful, but the analytic project is, is, I would say more expansive. It's right. obviously more expensive. It's, it's more expensive. It lasts longer. Um, there's not a script in the same way. There's not homework. Um, it's more of an exploration. Now there are 
manualized versions of psychoanalysis, like manualized meaning it goes by the book. So CBT is a manualized treatment. You can buy books to tell you how to do CBT. Um, but they, the, even the manualized, more analytically inflected treatments allow more for thinking. Thinking is really, now thinking's diff, it, it's involved in CBT, but thinking in psychoanalysis is more it, having one's own thoughts, having one's own experience of the world, um, not being impinged upon by other people in the way that many people feel they are, if that makes sense. But I interrupted you when you were talking about um, CBT, so I don't know if you had a thought still about that. But no, no, you you were right. You were right. I was um, I was I was kind of too focused on that on on the idea of, of anonymity and security. You're right. Um, I'm just thinking that. This is this is I'm I'm going somewhere with this with it with this this line of questioning. I suppose where I was going with it was that um, to an extent, on the face of it, I have to say I I don't I don't see what psychoanalysis offers that mm-hmm. can't be found anywhere else. And and this I know this is a common a common criticism of, of psychoanalysis and and that statement kind of kind of begs the question what's the point in it i mean i mean cbt is is it's the gold standard for, you know i mean across the board i think it's around about two two thirds of patients um get better from it and it's a lot cheaper <laughs> it's probably a lot e- more easily accessible there's probably more therapists out there so yeah does i mean does does psychoanalysis still have a, a purpose and a place nowadays? Okay, so, well, let me say recently, I don't know, the last decade or so, there's been a number of critiques of the outcome studies, the way that outcome studies of therapeutic outcome studies are developed. And the argument has been made, and there's been other outcome studies showing that psychoanalytic psychotherapy has just as good outcomes. It's just if you ask, if you look at the right outcome measures. So the outcome measures that were being used were one specific to issues that CBT dealt with. If you enlarge the outcome measures, basically psychoanalytic psychotherapy or psychodynamic psychotherapy does just as well. What is common to all good outcomes is the relationship to the therapist. And psychoanalysis is very focused on the relationship between the analyst and the patient. So is there a place? So CBT, you know, it, it works, but it's, it's limited. The, the outcome, the goals are limited. I would say psycho, you know, lying on the couch four times a week, go for years, right. It's out of reach of most people. It's, it's extremely expensive, but there are versions of psychoanalytic thinking and treatment that are more accessible and I think quite useful. So, for example, trauma, which is a major issue, it, there's many different treatments for trauma, but long term psychotherapy is probably the most effective in trauma long-term treatment, you know, of severely traumatized people. So, you know, is there a place for psychoanalysis? I think there's a place for allowing people the experience of, of having their own mind, of having their own experience in a way that many people have not had. So I know that sounds really vague, but it's... It, what psychoanalysis offers is very different than what a, a sort of short-term course of CBT offers. It's an exploration of self. Um, it's a trying to understand why do I act the way I do? So it's not just looking at my thoughts. It's looking at, you know, in my patterns of cognition, but it's looking at 
my behaviors over the long term. And it's looking at in this very intense setting how I re relate to this person, the analyst, in a very intimate way and learning from that and changing from that, hopefully. Um, it's very hard for people to change. Go ahead. Yeah, would you say that maybe the, the, the main divide that I'm kind of picking up between psychoanalysis and, and then these other cognitive-based therapies is that maybe the difference is how kind of broad the problem is. So if you've got a, if you've got a, a problem with OCD, maybe a contamination issue or, you know, a, a specific kind of depression that CBT might be right for those. But if you yeah. feel, if you feel like things just, you know, if, if it's a bit more nebulous for you, because I don't suppose you can go into a CBT, CBT therapist and say, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> just things aren't just right and I, I keep I'm getting involved in destructive um, relationships and I'm not sure that that would work the same way whereas it seems that psychoanalysis might be the place for those broader nebulous more deep-rooted personality type issues mm -hmm. is that is that an accurate I think, that's, I think that's fair because I think you know a broad-minded psychoanalyst would say for OCD maybe a course of CBT would be useful and maybe it wouldn't, but why not try it? Um, so think of an, I'll think of an example um, that comes from my line of work. Say you have uh, someone who can't finish writing their thesis, right? I can relate to this one. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem, so, and I'm a director of graduate studies, so I often say to my students, you know, when it become when it comes to writing the dissertation, I'm a behaviorist, right? You gotta like set up the conditions for success. You've gotta set yourself goals. You've gotta reward yourself. You've gotta, um, you know, set up a strict behavioral schedule. You know, you can't wait for inspiration. It's perspiration. It's like nine to five or nine to one, and you know, sitting in front of the computer and at some point it becomes more painful to not write than it is to write and so on and so on. So, you know, behavior, that works for a lot of people. But there's also people who can't finish because they've got some kind of psychic conflict. So just to pull out one that, that actually you can find in the literature, and I've talked to analysts who have um, treated people who have these issues, say finishing your dissertation means surpassing your father if you're a man say it means you know your father did okay in life but didn't do great and you finish your dissertation and you feel like if you write it you are going to kill your father sounds kind of edible mm. but people do have fantasies of that sort that, you know, they will outdo their father and you're not allowed to do that, right? You're not allowed to kill your father. So they undermine their success. Um, probably a more behavioral therapist isn't going to get at the roots of that. Now they might not be aware of that, right? It's not, I put it very schematically and it might not be quite that simple, but you know, finishing something and owning something that's that you've done or having your own voice or might feel to you, the patient, like you are doing something to your parents. You're establishing your autonomy. You're becoming your own person. You're going against some kind of family ethos. All those things. Who knows? There could be any number of reasons, but there's something going on. And a psychodynamic or a psychoanalytic treatment might be able to get at that and help you finish writing this thing that you're stuck on because you don't know what is holding you down. You don't know what web you're caught in. And that sort of thing, people's writing blocks can be cleared up by this kind of treatment. And if you're, what is it that's holding me back? I have no idea what it is. Um, what's my perfectionism all about? What's my obsessionality all about? Why am I so obsessional about this? Why do I get stuck on this word? 
all that kind of thing. That would be the kind of thing that a, a psychoanalyst could really help someone with. Yeah, that's interesting. I suppose there's some, there seems something really um, kind of uh, maybe symbolic about that predicament. And is that mm-hmm. is that something that psychoanalysis does deal with? Is is that kind of, the, the kind of symbolic relationships that, oh, yeah. that exist in life? Because we all carry around representations of other people inside of us. So if you think of like grandparents or great grandparents who have died that you were close to, you know, I certainly feel this. Like I still have those people inside me. I still think of them. Yeah. They still mean something to me. I still feel like I have a relationship to them. They're dead, but they're still in us. And those are what analysts call inner objects. So all of us have people inside of us that we relate to in various ways. We might have an overly critical parent inside of us, even if the parent's still alive. The internalized parent, this is object relations psychoanalysis. It's the brand of psychoanalysis that I really like and think is the most powerful. We can take a like mildly critical parent and turn that parent into a wildly critical parent, internal sensor inside of us that's always stopping us all the time. Or we can take a really, you know, that the parent could be that way. What matters is the internalized parent. If the parent inside is always saying to you, you're stupid, you don't know what you're doing, you're worthless. And there are parents who do this to children. You know, that's going to have an effect on us. And that's going to hold us back. That's going to shape the way we exist in the world. So the analyst will try and figure out who are those internal objects? How are they affecting the patient? How are they speaking to the patient? How are they holding them back? So if you think about, let's go back again to the young person who can't finish his dissertation. Say he had a a super critical father. And as he's writing, he's his super critical father, internal father is constantly telling him it's not good enough. You're not good enough. You'll never be as good as your older brother, Johnny. You'll never do what he did. You know, he's a success. You're a failure, whatever. You can imagine many different scenarios, but you, if you're, if that's happening to you, you're not aware of that. You just know that you feel terrible. Um, and you know that something saying this to you, but the, the goal of the analysis would be to understand that that's an internal object that is saying that to you, that you don't have to be under that object's control. You might feel like you have to be under that person's control, but that's internal. It's not outside. It's in you. So we hold ourselves back in various ways because of all these internal objects. Yeah, I suppose I'm, um the way I'm kind of concept conceptualizing this, trying to visualize it as you're saying it is, I suppose from the, like the, the cognitive perspective would be, well, the exercise might be for you to try and change the dialogue of this, this internal dialogue that you, you, you hear from your, your critical father say yeah. the exercise there might be to try and change the, the, the dialogue, try and change what he's saying or try and change the tone of, um, those kinds of things but even now when you're saying this i'm not convinced that that's going to work because it it seems that those those things those things you hear those experiences you have as children growing up in those formative years especially from adults that are so influential and seem so powerful when you're a child Mm. yeah i'm not convinced that there's a way necessarily of just trying to rework the dialogue in your mind and and that that's that's going to work for you and that yeah you you really you really do need to kind of dig dig down a bit deeper into that um and the psychoanalyst might offer you is an experience of another person who is not that critical demeaning always putting you down person so the experience 
Right, you're right. You can't just do away with the. I mean, those voices are in you. Yeah, it's too deep rooted. They're very powerful. They take hold. So the goal would be to both loosen their hold, to realize that not just by talking back to them, but by an experience of a relationship with another person, an intense relationship with another person that has boundaries. You know, it's, it's a very specific relationship, um, but you can really use that person to try and experience what it would be like to have a parent who's not so critical all the time, to have a parent who actually appreciates things about you, to have a parent who celebrates your achievements rather than putting them down. So that would be one of the things that you might do in a good analysis is have a different experience of a parental figure. It doesn't mean that you have to kill your parents. It means that you can kind of some of the toxicity of that internal parent can be kind of neutralized. Yeah, I think I've got to say it's one, it's one of the more kind of convincing arguments for me i mean i've never i've never had any kind of um psychoanalytic therapy or anything but i just i, I do think it's one of the one of the more convincing aspects of it is that that it, it does it does look at those those deeper things those those things from the past i know like cognitive therapy is very much kind of focused on what's going on now you know we, we deal with the now and, and move forward um and i'm i'm not always Obviously, I'm not an expert, but I'm just just intuitively, I'm not always convinced that that's necessarily going to be enough for people. Right. I think it can be helpful in the moment, but does it does it stick? It's really hard to change. It's exceptional, and psychoanalysis recognizes this. I mean, it's very hard to change our ways of being in the world. Um, Sorry, Liz. How how do we reconcile the, these two? these two ideas because at the beginning you mentioned that now the psychoanalysis isn't so much about digging down into the past and, and finding these kind of root causes but at the same time like the example we were just giving of of the critical mother or father that does sound like digging down into the past am i am i missing no that's a good question and it's it's but what evidence does the analyst have? The analyst only has the evidence of what is happening in the moment. Right. Because the analyst wasn't there. So the analyst, the patient might not even realize that the patient, that the parent was so critical. All the patient knows is that this is what starts happening when I get near to producing something, say. I start to feel like it's no good. I start to feel like I'm like I'm worthless. Um, little exploration, so that you know, and the maybe the patient thinks the analyst is saying you're worthless. Why are you always thinking I'm so worthless? And the analyst is thinking, wait a minute, I'm not thinking that. This is something from the patient. You know, the analyst will explore, am I being pulled into this, being, you know, acting the role of the super hypercritical parent? Maybe I am. But they'll be aware of it and try and sort it out. Um, so, sure, it does rely on a kind of hypothesis about the past. But it's, it's not about just telling stories from the past, although there certainly would be stories about the past. It's also looking at what is going on in the inter action in the moment which is the the sort of real data for people who subscribe to this version of psychoanalysis like the here and now it's called um you know if i the analyst say something and the patient reacts as if i've just destroyed them with criticism that's information to me the analyst that this is someone who can't tolerate Criticism. Maybe they can't tolerate it because they're exceptionally narcissistic and have to be perfect. Maybe they can't tolerate it because they were. This is what happened when they were a child. They had to be perfect, um, 
or they were a non-person, which is some people's experience. You know, if you're not a perfect child, you don't exist, you're dead to me. But it's the interaction in the moment that will provide the kind of truth of the matter for the analyst who can then discuss that with the patient. But it, it calls on the past, but it's rooted in a, a contemporaneous interaction. And this will happen over and over and over. That's what will, that's the tr truth value is that the patient will keep engaging in the same behaviors, keep having the same reactions. And that will attest to how important that structure of interaction is in that person's inner life. You see, I am, um, even, even playing devil's advocate before. Oh yeah. But, um, I definitely think, just from a, a, a personal perspective, I definitely think psychoanalysis has, uh, has got its place. I quite like the idea of sitting down and having that kind of free-ranging conversation with a therapist because I think the other, the other the other thing that you could kind of maybe say about you know things like CBT, ACT, or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, whatever, is that because there's such a narrow the set within such a narrow paradigm, you could almost accuse the therapist of having an agenda to a certain mm -hmm. extent or trying to get get at something which fits within their remit. Whereas this seems much mm -hmm. a, a much more wide ranging conversation that can be had that doesn't have to stay at any any kind of particular path. And I do think there's something interesting about being able to sit down and just have that that sort of dialogue with somebody. The only problem with it is, apparently, so the av average session, 50 minutes to an hour, four to five times a week, and that can go on for years, that's definitely a barrier for some people. I mean, it is, is visiting a, a psychoanalyst, is that just the, you know, something for the reserve for the wealthy? Right. So... Um, analysts split on this. I mean, some analysts hold you can do analytic type treatments fewer times per week, especially with children. You know, child analysts, they're very flexible. It's, it's a more perspective they take. It's so when you've said before about you sometimes feel like the CBT or the I, you said mindfulness, although I think mindfulness has much in common with psychoanalysis. Um, therapists, they have a, a kind of agenda almost. Um, yeah, sorry, let me just clarify what I mean by that, because I, 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 what, what I mean by that is that when when you present with a problem, it's the the therapist has their their idea of what's causing the problem and their, you know, their kind of academic or theoretical reason for why it's happening and then it's like right well then here are the things that we need to do to fix that that's what i mean by by an agenda and i, I just think sometimes it'd be nicer to just sit down with somebody talk about your problems without this let's get to fixing it kind of attitude right but sorry go on well so i mean good analysts don't know because everybody's unique now, of course, they have hypotheses. Of course, they have thoughts. They're constantly, you know, processing and thinking and associating and trying to figure out what's going on. But they don't know what will happen in an hour. And in that way, they don't have an agenda. The agenda is set by the patient. Now, if the patient is just spinning her wheels and getting nowhere, certainly that would be... Um, a topic for conversation to figure out what's what's being avoided, what's being resisted, what what is so painful to talk about that it can't be talked about. Um, but it, it is more open ended. Um, now, it, it a second like approach can inform psychodynamic psychotherapy, which can be do, done one tw once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Um, right, the the critique that. It's, you know, psychoanalysis is expensive and time intensive is certainly hard to argue with. Some people feel it's life and death for them, especially 
I would say from my own experience of knowing um, people in the field, um, people who have been traumatized. Um, there's a lot of trauma out there, um, especially, but other, you know, people who can't form relationships sometimes will feel like this is their only hope. Um, but, you know, many people are being trained as psychoanalysts, but they're not going to be doing only psychoanalytic treatments. They will also be doing psychodynamic treatments. Some of them work in hospitals, treating, um, you know, patients with psychoses. Um, they're not u- using psychoanalysis to treat them, but they are using sort of a psychoanalytic mindset at times. So, you know, good therapists are quite flexible. I, I don't imagine there's many maybe it's different in England, but I don't imagine there's many analysts who only do psychoanalysis. That would be hard to imagine. Yeah. Do you think, do you think, um, do you think a psychoanalyst would be okay with somebody? Maybe what, if you just wanted to go kind of blow off some steam with a psychoanalyst, say once a month, would they be open to that? Or is this, is this something that's a part of the practice that says, no, it has to be more, more often than that? Well, people vary on, you know, there's any range of number of opinions on that. I mean, once a month for 50 minutes, I don't think, I don't see how you could do psychoanalysis. Maybe if you finished seeing someone for years and then just want to do a once a month checkup, why not? But um, once a month, I mean, if you only talk to someone once a month, that's not very much. I don't know. I just I'm I, I'm mainly asking for myself to be honest. I think oh. <laughs> I just I quite like I quite I, I quite like the idea. I'm quite I'm I'm, I'm quite sold on that. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's it's a, it's a criticism of psychoanalysis that it is open ended. But for me, that's you know, depending what on perspective you're coming from, to me that that's the one of the benefits to it is uh-huh. is, is that it is open ended and and that it can be so kind of wide ranging. Um, you know, again, if I mean, when when I was I was did a course of uh, MCT metacognitive therapy for um, twelve weeks, and that was focused on a, a specific condition. But this, mm-hmm. you know, there's some days you want to go in there, and it's like, well, I don't want to talk about that one today. I want to talk about something else. But you have to kind of stay on course. So right. yeah, I do. I, right. I think there's something. I think there's something very kind of attractive with that. With that, like I say, the open ended and and the, and the wide ranging kind of the the availability there um let me just say oh go on can i just say on that that i think you hit on something very important which is the kind of freedom that psychoanalysis affords and one of the goals of psychoanalysis is to loosen up people um so that they can inhabit their selves in ways that they haven't been able to so that they can enjoy some of that freedom and you know, just live that their through their their own kind of personality, who they are, be who they are, instead of always you know answering to these internal objects or to outside pressures or something. So that something about that freedom that you're talking about, just like I don't want to work on this today. I just want to like be enthusiastic about something. That is part of the analytic process mm, and that's yeah. part of what analysis offers is kind of a, a, a freedom of of self yeah it is it's definitely a definitely an, a, an attractive prospect there's a couple of questions yeah. that have kind of got left hanging okay. um, that didn't really fit in anywhere um one was because look we, we've touched upon this at the beginning because psychoanalysis has evolved so much and that you know contemporary psychoanalysis doesn't inv- doesn't involve very much of what Freud originally established. Mm-hmm. Why why is it still called psychoanalysis? I mean, one one thing that's definite is it seems that CBTs and ACTs and MBCTs and MCTs everyone wants their own theory nowadays. You know, it's it, CBT with cheese. It's just that one little tiny difference, right. and then it, and then it's got a whole, a whole, it's a whole different school of thought apparently. But what is it about psychoanalysis that, despite evolving so much, it stayed under this one umbrella term? Well, there's many different schools of psychoanalysis, but um, 
psychoanalysis in the 1970s, I would say, at least in the United States, really opened up to having more than just like one orthodox line of thought. Um, and there's many varieties of psychoanalysis now, but right, they're all called psychoanalysis. I think most psychoanalysts have some relation to Freud, even if they're not Freudians. I mean, Freud was a, an amazing writer and thinker. He didn't get everything right. No one does. But I think many, I would say most psychoanalysts know Freud, know his work, have some kind of, are in some kind of engagement with Freud. So that's why I think it's so, and it's psychoanalysis is not just a body of thought. It's an, it has an institutional presence. Um, there's training institutes, there's licensure, there's many, many journals. Um, so it's a, it's a profession. And so people have a professional identity as psychoanalyst that, that matters. It's different than being a CBT therapist. Another one was, it seems the whole school of psychoanalysis, it kind of took off in the UK. It took off in the US. It seems to me that that's kind of predominantly where it's thriving now. No, so psychoanalysis is thriving in France. It's, it's thriving in Argentina. It's taking root in China. Um, there's, psycho, there's psychoanalytic institutes all over the world. It's not what it was, but there's also new areas of growth, for example, China. So, um, Oh, that's interesting. You see, I'm, I'm probably just falling prey to the, the caricature of it being a very Western-specific mm -hmm. kind of school of thought. Um, but I suppose one thing you've thrown up interesting there is it's, you say it's taking hold in China. Why, why is that? Why is it having a kind of I, second I, win there? I don't, know, I don't know enough about that. So I probably... I shouldn't say anything. I, I just don't know. I know, but I know that Western analysts have been training Chinese practitioners to become psychoanalysts. There's a lot of interest now in Buddhism and psychoanalysis and sort of overlap. So there's books on that. So there's a lot of, I mean, if you, if you go to the Karnak book site website, K A R N A C there, I mean, there are, Psychoanalytic books on everything. It is a huge industry, psychoanalysis. Uh, yeah, I mean, literary critiquing and movies and uh, all sorts. Right. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's very interesting. And it's part of sort of the business world where people are being coached by psychoanalysts, you know, leadership coaching and so on, conducted by, it's not called coaching, it's, you know, psychoanalytic consulting um to business leaders so there's a there's psychoanalysis in a lot of spaces okay um i'd be remiss if we kind of miss this one out i think so common criticisms of psychoanalysis i just wondering if you could kind of pick one or two that you thought were one or two that you think are fair and then one or two that you think are unfair well, so a fair one would be one that you've already brought up, which is about the accessibility issue. And, you know, is, is it a practice that is only available to the worried well or to the relatively well off? I mean, that's a, that's a big issue. And it, I know it's something that analysts think about and how they can provide more treatment for patients who don't have the resources um, to engage in, you know, five times a week, years long treatment and issues about race and, and ethnicity in the United States are big among psychoanalysts, like the relative paucity of practitioners of color. Um, although that's changed, um, you know, there are more and more going into it, going into, um, the profession. So those issues I, I think are fair. Um, the unfair, I guess, um, you know, Freud was a dirty old man obsessed with sex, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you still see that as a kind <laughs> yeah. of criticism. I think, come on, uh, you know, are we still stuck on that? 
Man, you say, say, saying that, Liz, I did see a quote from his um, from Freud's wife, and it's not a direct quote. It was someone heard her say that um, it was something like, if my husband didn't take this psychoanalysis business so seriously, I'd assume it was just pornography or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some, some <laughs> quote like that. She viewed it basically as a form of pornography. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I mean, and Freud was like, well, I'm offending the world by talking about sex. But I think he also felt he was offending the world by saying that we're not masters of our of ourselves. We have this thing that he called the unconscious and that we have motivations that are unconscious. We have behaviors that we engage in because we don't know why. And if you look at the world, you think all the things that the weird things that people do that they're not aware aware of it would be hard to say he was completely off base on that yeah i was getting well no we'll leave that because we're going to end up, end up going down a, another a complete different rabbit hole there so um oh no i'll tell you what i will say though <laughs> just on, on that on that finishing note is um one thing you hear caught i hear this all the time oh a lot of uh a lot of freud's theories have been debunked yada 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 and it's funny whenever you ask people to give examples <laughs> They don't go beyond that little uh -huh. quip. Um, do you think history will show that Freud's contribution to psychology was valid? And and what I mean by that is, I don't mean Freud as this huge looming figure, as like the the, mm -hmm. the godfather of psychology. I mean the the kind of the validity of his ideas that he he, he put forth. Do you think there were a worthwhile contribution uh, and still a wor worthwhile contribution. I think history's already shown that, you know, we can't root out psychoanalysis. People have tried to do it, um, but it's become part of our everyday understanding. For example, we believe that childhood really matters now, that what happens to you as a child, I mean, that's sort of a very rough Freudian idea or the idea of a Freudian slip. Every, you know, most people kind of get that, that when you say something embarrassing and it's a Freudian slip, that it's like, oh, you know, there's something that you didn't mean to say that you're actually saying. Um, if you look at advertising, for example, um, and the way that that plays on sort of our desire on the one hand to be abstemious and frugal and on the other hand, you know, this roiling id of desire and so on. I mean, the whole advertising industry is built on a kind of Freudian understanding of human nature and motivation. I, I don't think it can be rooted out. Can the practice of psychoanalysis be rooted out? Maybe, but I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, it's diminished from what it was. On the other hand, it's spreading for example, to China. So, um, you know, was Freud right or wrong? T to my mind is less the question. That's how many critics put it. Well, Freud was wrong. W what does it mean to say he was wrong? There's so many different things he said, and he set up a, he was part of setting up an institutional structure that has had enormous staying power and influence. We'll see where, what happens. Um, I think psychoanalysis can help us understand some of the stuff that's going on in the world today, like Brexit or Trump. <laughs> um, so, you know, do we, if Freud hadn't offered us this way of looking at things, maybe someone else would have, we don't know. But I think the question is not, you know, is Freud right or wrong, but where can we find psychoanalysis in the culture now and i think there's many different places where we can find it although it's not always labeled as psychoanalysis like in advertising for example right okay liz i'm going to, before i let you go i'm going to subject you to my quick fire questions that everyone has to go through <laughs> so before that one though um yeah do you have any uh, do you have any book recommendations on this topic or anything else you feel would be of value to the listeners oh um, there's a, the, uh, there's two books by Alison Bechtel, who's a cartoonist. One is called Fun Home, and the other is called Are You My Mother? They're graphic novels. 
So they're easy to get into. They're very psychoanalytic. They're about her growing up and um, coming out and living as a lesbian cartoonist and her family conflicts. They're fascinating. It's a painless way to get into psychoanalysis, uh, especially the second one is about Winnicott, her relationship to Winnicott. Okay. If you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked, however niche or bizarre, what would it be and why? Oh, yay, yay. Um, unlimited funds. I guess I would want to know, and this comes out of my own work and my dissatisfaction with the line of argument that the younger generation are all narcissists. I'd want to know more about the sort of millennials, like what are their aspirations? I, I find I find young people very the ones that I teach and then I come across in various parts of my life don't conform to the stereotype that's in the literature of you know self obsessed blah blah blah. Um, I guess I want to know just have a sort of exploratory study. Tell me more about young people's lives, dreams, ambitions. And some, you know, what, what what would help them realize their ambitions? I'd like to know more about that. Like what's holding them back besides my generation? Okay. <laughs> so. If you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Is this the Department of Health of the U.S.? Oh, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's just a general term. Like, just think yes. just think you can walk into the White House and you can dictate a policy to improve. First, the president, but second, and the vice president, because I think they both have personality issues. Um, <laughs> I think I would go for support for families, for mothers, and for children. And... If I had to go back to the unlimited funds, I'd support young children and their parents. Give everyone the best start. Yeah, because everything is premised on that. And we're doing terribly on that. What, if anything, keeps you up at night? Uh, my president having the nuclear codes. <laughs> and his tweeting about North Korea. So it's very, yeah, I'm worried. I'm not the only one. No, it's keeping a few of us up at night, that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, literally, yes. What is the best piece of life advice anyone's ever given you? Hmm. That's a hard one. I guess it sounds cliched, but don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> and I like that one. <laughs> I really think it's important to realize that there's a lot of naysayers and awful people out there, but yep. you've got to just ignore them. Yeah, definitely. Oh, th this, this is a, a very psychoanalytical question, I think, this. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? Mm. I think I'm getting better on this, but, and I think it's something that maybe a lot of us are susceptible to, so I'm protecting myself here, but, you know, being taken in too much by people's surface, maybe. I mean, I'm thinking again of, you know, like our president, I don't want to say his name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> To many people, many people see him as like a god. Um, you know, leaders can appear very beguiling, very powerful. I don't think I'm still susceptible to this, but I know I have been in the course of my life. Donald Trump getting his ass kicked on on the podcast this week. <laughs> I didn't mention his name. Okay, final three. What part of your career are you most proud of? I don't know. I guess what I'm doing now, I'm kind of enjoying that I'm doing, I'm able to do 
what I set out to do, um, which is to be a historian, but also I feel like, um, you know, I'm able to impact the lives of young people, which, and to open their eyes to ways of thinking that they weren't aware of. And I'm, that's what really I enjoy. Okay. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? Um, I would have to say taking cycling trips through Europe. So I used to be a cyclist and not anymore because I had two very bad accidents, but so I, I, you know, travel, but something about seeing the, you know, at the pace you do when you're on a bicycle, sort of not too fast, not too slow, getting to interact with sort of ordinary local people. I don't know, beautiful mountain scenery. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, I don't know why it, it keeps cycling. I think cycling has been the answer to that question about five times so far. Seems to be. If people should cycle, it's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> it's like the most amazing, much better than psychoanalysis. <laughs> right. The final one. And before I ask you, you're not allowed to say impeaching the president. What, oh, please. <laughs> what, do, what do you think is the key to happiness? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, I think Freud was right on this one. You know, finding the work that you love and the people that you love. I think you need both. I think, you know, feeling fulfilled at work and whatever you do, is your vocation, your avocation, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be paid work, is critical. But also, being surrounded by people with whom you have a relationship, I think really matters. Okay, Liz, thank you very much. Is there any links you'd like to direct the listeners to? Are you on social media? This is your opportunity to plug away like crazy. I'm actually not on social media. Um, so I, I wrote a book on narcissism, so I don't like to self-promote. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, <laughs> yes. Well, it's the Americanization of narcissism. <laughs> so I'll throw that in there for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I will. I will include a link. A link in the in the show notes. And maybe it's maybe we could come back and and talk about that maybe at some point. The topic of narcissism. Um, oh, I'd love. To, yeah. But elizabethlumbeck dot com. I think you've got a website. I do. Yes. Right. So there we go. We're done. Liz Lumbeck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. This was really enjoyable. You um, asked fantastic questions. Thank you. Your 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 quick quick study. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, folks. If you enjoyed this episode, you, well, actually, for those of you who didn't enjoy this episode, you guys can bugger off and skip this bit because it doesn't apply to you. But if you did enjoy this episode and you'd like to help support this podcast, there are a number of ways you can do so. You could blast out a little mention on social media saying, yeah, check this knobhead out. He's actually pretty good. You could like our Facebook page or leave us a review there. Even better, just search for My Own Worst Enemy on Facebook. I'm sure we'll pop up. You could leave us a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher or whichever podcast service you happen to use. It's always a, a nice way of encouraging new listeners to give us a whirl. Or if you're feeling particularly generous and you feel that this podcast is genuinely adding some value and you'd like to support it in a more long-term sense, then you can become a subscriber for as little as a pound a month, or you could just make a one-off donation again for as little as a pound, but only if you can afford it and, you know, no donations from stolen credit cards either, please. Can't be arsed with that hassle. So yeah, plenty of things to keep you busy there while I go busy myself putting the next episode together. So in the meantime, as I always say, behave yourselves but not too much, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>